unfortunately we've just run out of rules to discuss. Um, <laughs> 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 unless we want to start, uh, uh, unless we get uh, Gary here and start talking about other rules of other sports. Uh, but uh, but it's a, it's a, we're finishing with a bang, and thanks in part thanks to Keely Lineman who uh, uh, brought her Girl Scout cookies I've ordered today, which I'm not sharing. But um, uh, today, what we'll do, and a uh, uh, fair chance it will be a shorter session session than usual, is we'll finish up with uh, rules 33 and 34, and then uh, talk about any questions. Uh, uh, in particular, you might have whether on the WSGA practice exam or elsewhere, and then we will uh, spend some time on the uh, practice exam. Uh, Bill, Bill's highlighted a few questions. It'd be good to uh, go over and go over any others uh, that you want us to. So, so with that in mind, uh, Rule 33, and it's helpful to look at Rule 33 as a companion to Rule 6 that we went over. Uh, uh, many sessions ago. The Rule 6, as you recall, outlines the player's responsibilities, and Rule 33 outlines the committee's responsibilities, and the two often uh, go hand in hand. For example, uh, Rule 6-6 -6 talks about how the player is responsible for the correct hole-by-hole -hole scores on a scorecard and the two signatures on the scorecard. And Rule 33 will tell us that the committee is responsible for the addition of the scores on the scorecard, the application of the handicap, the determination of the results, and the bogey par stable for competition. So in that regard, the two rules do work uh, hand in hand uh, together. All right, Rule 33-1. Uh, the committee must establish the conditions under which a competition is to be played, and there are uh, uh, there's a great variety of uh, conditions uh, the committee would establish. It starts with the basic things such as uh, eligibility. Uh, are there any uh, age requirements, handicap requirements, any uh, gender restrictions, any amateur status restrictions, uh, and so forth to play in a competition. The dates, uh, the schedule, and so forth. Uh, that's all part of the uh, conditions uh, of, of the competition. A uh, committee has no power uh, to waive a rule of golf. So a committee cannot say, for example, well, we're playing by the rules of golf today, except you can carry as many clubs as you'd like. And as we've seen, that you can, can have such dramatically different rulings for the same incident in stroke play and in match play that it's just not uh, practical to play the two forms concurrently, and therefore that is uh, not only discouraged, but prohibited. Uh, so if the players were to uh, play a match and concurrently play in a stroke play competition, uh, the result of the match uh, would be considered null and void, and the uh, stroke play in, in the stroke play competition, they're actually disqualified. Again, because there's just not a good way uh, to combine the two forms of play. For example, we saw that in uh, match play, if you play from outside the team ground, your opponent has a choice. You can either let the stroke stand or he can require you to cancel and replay from within the team ground. Whereas in stroke play, it's a very different result. You have to correct the mistake uh, with a, a two stroke penalty. And in stroke play, the committee may limit the referee's duties. Uh, the most uh, common example of that is sometimes a committee will uh, not let individual referees have the authority to declare an area to be ground under repair if it was not marked. Uh, and the thinking is to ensure the consistent treatment of that area throughout that round, if not the competition. So, for example, at the U.S. Open, the committee might say that only the rovers have the authority to declare something to be ground under repair, with the thinking that a rover is going to be in that area for the entire day, and he can therefore ensure that it's uh, tr uh, treated the same way. Whereas uh, an, a, fit, a referee with the third group out may say, oh, no, that's not ground under repair. But then the referee, three, uh, four groups after that, says, oh, yes, that is ground under repair. That's not, a, as, you, un, as you can imagine, a desirable situation in uh, stroke play for players to receive different treatment of the same uh, area. Course. Rule 33-2A, uh, defining bounds and margins. 
the committee must define accurately the course and out of bounds, uh, margins of water hazards, metal water hazards, ground on repair, and obstructions and in integral parts of the course. You know that this is a requirement. It's not an encouragement. It's a uh, requirement. Uh, and there, that right there is actually a hint for the uh, WSJ rules exam for one question on there. It's a uh, must as we uh, and I talk about. In fact, there is an article coming out in the next issue of uh, our uh, magazine about the importance of marking the course. That uh, the rules of golf are based on the assumption that the golf course has been properly marked. And if it has not been properly marked, in many cases, the rules are not going to have an answer as to how to proceed in a certain situation. And as I've mentioned before, having an unmarked golf course is similar to having, say, an unmarked uh, football field uh, without any uh, sidelines, without a clear uh, end zone, without any uh, goalposts. That how how can you tell if a field goal is good if there are no goalposts up there? Likewise, how can you tell if a ball is in a water hazard if there are, uh, aren't isn't a water hazard line? So. Uh, very uh, important uh, to do, as well as, you know, while it has the practical uh, need, it also sends the message to the golfers, whether it's in the tournament or that play there on a daily basis, <coughs> that the committee in charge uh, appreciates uh, what's going on, appreciates the rules of golf, and appreciates the need to uh, uh, define the course properly. 33-2B, <coughs> new holes. New holes, uh, it's interesting, you can tell this is somewhat of an old uh, rule. Uh, new holes should be made on the day on which a stroke play competition begins and other times the committee considers necessary. An important part in a stroke play competition is that each player in each round needs to play to the same hole location. Again, just to make sure that you can really compare apples to apples uh, at the end of the round. And it's uh, interesting that today, uh, people get so worked up and obsessed with hole locations, moving them around and balancing them out for the two, three, four rounds and so forth. And that's not always been the case that, remember reading uh, one account of the 1953 uh, British Open at Carnoustie that Ben Hogan won, and, which was played in three days with 36 holes on the third day, and they did not move the holes during the uh, championship. That They start with fresh holes on the first day and that whole location is the whole location for the entire championship. And it's interesting to think how far we've come uh, since then. Uh, exception, uh, as uh, can happen, sometimes, uh, say, player, it's a full approach shot that uh, hits the hole and just destroys it. Ideally, the committee will be able to just repair that damaged hole and have players uh, play on, but sometimes that's not possible and they need, may need to actually have another hole cut. Uh, probably just a yard or so away uh, for the remainder of the round. Yeah, uh, interesting note that was really uh, added uh, several years ago for, uh, say, club play when uh, perhaps because of people's work schedules, people simply couldn't play on the same day. This note would allow a committee, if it wants, to have a competition for, let's say, the members of a club, uh, and even if say the two days of play would be let's say Tuesday and Saturday to accommodate the, those who work and those who don't work and still have those people be considered to play in the same 18 hole competition and compare scores even though the, they may play uh, very different courses with regards to the tees and the hole locations and as well as possibly uh, weather. So it's not ideal but that does allow for some of a pragmatic uh, approach. Uh, practice ground uh, uh, the committee is encouraged but not required uh, to establish a uh, practice area if there's not a practice uh, area available. Uh, normally, on a stroke day of stroke play competition, it's not a good idea to permit practice on or to a putting green or from a hazard uh, on the competition course. 33-2D. Uh, if the committee considers that the course is not in a playable condition, and as the rule says, that could be for any reason. Normally, it's because of casual water. 
but it could be because of wind. Uh, for example, that balls are not coming to rest on putting greens, uh, uh, or it could be just for for uh, for other purposes. The course can, uh, for example, a, a green that is just uh, too uh, uh, too firm, too fast. Uh, the committee in stroke play or match play may temporarily suspend play or in stroke play only uh, cancel uh, that round. And in which case, when a round is canceled, all penalties incurred in that round are canceled, which can be a very uh, good deal for some uh, players. So one point, uh, a key point to take away from this is that in match play, uh, any golf uh, cannot be canceled. That it, let's say even to take the extreme case in the state match play, players in a group in a match tee off the first hole, they hit their tee shots, and then there's a suspension of play, and it just rains nonstop for two days. They can't resume play until several days later. Well, when it's time to resume play, they're going to do just that, resume play, go back out to where they were in the first fairway or first landing area, and resume play from there, even though it would be nice and simple to say, guys, you just hit one tee shot. You know, we're going to cancel the round and just play again from the tee. Can't do that in uh, match play. In stroke play, uh, you can. It's very rare in stroke play that a round is uh, canceled, but that is uh, that that is possible. Now, Rule 33-3, uh, the committee is responsible for establishing the starting times in stroke play uh, for arranging the groups in which the competitors uh, are to play. In this next paragraph is a helpful one for committees, uh, and you see this especially at the club level. Uh, because it has a, a recommendation that can help uh, help committees avoid some very um, unpleasant situations. When a match play competition is played over an extended period, uh, the committee establishes the limit of time within which each round must be complete. So let's say, for example, it's the club championship and two players in a match, they always have, let's say, a week or two weeks within which to uh, play their match. And it, so the committee will say, okay, by uh, uh, June 24th, uh, Andy and Arnold must have played their match. And that's fine, but then you can inevitably run into some situations where what if their two schedules just don't allow them to get together and play before on or before June 24th? How does the committee determine who advances? Well, this is uh, where the next sentence comes in. When players are allowed to arrange the date of their match within these limits, the committee should announce that the match must be played at a stated time on the last day of the period unless the players agree to a prior date. So in other words, it's helpful to the committee to say, okay, Andy and Arnold, you have to play at 9-10 on June 24th unless you can agree to an earlier time. If they agree to an earlier time, fine. If they don't, then whoever is not there at 9-10 on the 24th uh, loses. And that helps the committee avoid a uh, difficult situation. So by actually assigning them a starting time on that last day uh, helps uh, a good bit. Now rule 33-4, it's the committee's responsibility to establish the handicap uh, stroke table. Now rule 33-5, uh, a rule for uh, stroke play only. Uh, there's a match play, remember that a scorecard carries no official significance. The committee must provide each competitor with a scorecard that has the date and uh, the player's name. Uh, and the committee is responsible for adding the scores and applying the handicap. In four ball play, the committee is responsible for figuring out the better ball score for each hole and also applying the handicaps and then adding the better ball scores. In a bogey par and stable for competition, the committee is responsible for applying any handicap and determining the result of each hole and the overall uh, result. So the committee has to determine, for example, okay, did Andy in the stable for competition, did Andy win two points on that hole, one point, three points, no points, and so forth. So all of that adds up to, frankly, a lot of work uh, by the committee. So. Imagine, say, from Bill's perspective, you know, worst case scenario of how you can make scoring as challenging as possible. Imagine, say, a shotgun start, so everybody's finishing at the same time, a four ball event, 
with handicaps that's stable for you. Now that would take a while at the end of the round to sort through that. And we're probably, probably not hurrying to uh, to add that to the uh, schedule. But that would that, that'd be a lot. And that places an awful lot of responsibility on the committee. And uh, uh, it, it takes time. It takes time. So uh, please, uh, uh, players should, be, uh, sh should appreciate that. Rule 33-6 about uh, ties. The committee must, it's not, not should, but must announce the manner, day, and time for the decision of a half match or of a tie, whether played on level terms or under handicap. This is something that can be determined well in advance. And that, for example, in the entry forms for the U.S. Open this year, it already states what will happen if there's a play, if there's a tie after 72 holes. The entry form states there'll be an 18-hole playoff the day after on that Monday, and if after 18 holes there's still a tie, then it'll be continued hole by hole. That it was back uh, when I would answer phone calls at the USGA. It was uncanny how often. On a say a Monday, a club would call up and say, you know, we had a tournament this weekend and ended in a tie. What should we do? And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of odd timing to be asking that question. And that really uh, answer is it's up to them, and that should be stated beforehand. Because if you state it beforehand, you're not surprising people, and therefore they don't have in the way of playing. But if you don't announce before how a tie will be decided. Uh, without a doubt, one of the players affected by that uh, decision will not be happy, and you know, with uh, with, with some uh, valid reason. Now, the only prohibition about uh, deciding ties is that a half match must not be decided by stroke play, and a tie in stroke play must not be decided by a match. Even though you hear on television uh, often, whether it's in a playoff or players come down stretch when it's just two players. They'll say, well, it's really a match play situation. And that's really uh, not at all the case for, for so many reasons. One, because I'm, they're still playing stroke play rules. Two, because it's, the rules don't allow them to play match play. And three, because especially when it's still during the, uh, say, the fourth round, in match play, remember, you can, the worst result for a hole is a loss of hole, whereas in stroke play, you could have a four-stroke swing on a hole. So very different uh, ramifications and mindsets for those two uh, forms of play. Uh, so if, uh, if a club has a stroke play competition and they know that because they have a full field that they're, they're not going to have enough daylight at the end of the day to go back out and uh, play extra holes, they could uh, match scorecards, a common way to do it, and there's a recommended method in Appendix 1 for doing so. They, and if they, and if, if they want to have a putting or chipping uh, playoff uh, because they know that their practice putting green is well lit at night, they can do that. If they want the players arm wrestle, that's okay. The one thing, one and only thing they can't do is have the players uh, play match play. 33-7. A uh, penalty of disqualification may in exceptional, underline exceptional individual cases be waived, modified, or imposed if the committee considers such action warranted. We talked about this uh, in the context of Rule 6-3A, time of starting, how if a player is, uh, uh, say, um, more than five minutes late for his time of starting, the penalty prescribed by that rule is disqualification, but there can be some wild circumstances in which the committee might waive that penalty. Um, for example, if, you know, I'm sure people are tired of hearing this example, but if a player uh, stops on the way to the course to administer first aid to someone in a car accident, you know, it would it'd be, uh, make sense to uh, not to uh, disqualify that player. Any penalty less than disqualification must not be you know, waived or modified. So, for example, if a player incurs a two-stroke penalty under Rule 13-2, can't just say, oh, that's okay, we won't apply that. So this is really, uh, that first paragraph really deals just with disqualification penalties. Uh, last, if a uh, committee considers that a player is guilty of a serious breach of etiquette, it may impose a penalty of disqualification under this rule. So let's look at decision 33-7-8. 
which gives some guidance as to what is meant by a serious breach of etiquette. Uh, let's see, it starts on the bottom of page 515 and really and continues on top 516. A serious breach of etiquette is behavior by a player that shows significant disregard for an aspect of the etiquette section, such as intentionally distracting another player or intentionally offending someone. So I think in that sentence, uh, key part, key phrases or words are significant disregard and and intentionally distracting and intentionally offending someone. So it's not doesn't apply if someone is just clueless and doesn't realize he's being rude. But rather, it applies, it applies to someone who is intentionally uh, being a jerk. Now, although a committee may disqualify a player under Rule 33-7 for a single act. In most cases, it's recommended that the penalty be imposed only in the event of a further serious breach. And often what will be the case, say, when a player uh, starts to lose his cool and starts to throw clubs and so forth, is it's appropriate for a committee member to go over and say, you need to stop doing that. This is a warning. And if you don't stop doing that, then you'll be disqualified for a serious breach of etiquette. And that's a, a good way uh, to do it as you put the player on notice. But ultimately, it, it is the committee's discretion. And it's certainly, you could have cases where, say, if uh, one player hauls off and just slugs his fellow competitor, you know, it makes sense to go ahead and disqualify him for that one act. But I'm curious, this provision was added in either 2004 or 2008. I forget like which. Eight. 2008, you think? Has, has anyone ever had to... Uh, Disqualify somebody under this? Yeah. You have Gene? For well, what was the. Uh, it's the uh, attacking an official? Attacking a. Once by lights from air crossing that fairway in the landing area of the fairway, and balls would often be deflected by them and so forth. And they asked what, if anything, they could do from a local rules perspective uh, to address the situation. And, and the USGA said that it would be okay to uh, extend the thinking behind that local rule for elevated power lines to say that if a ball struck uh, or one of the landing lights that uh, the uh, the committee could require the player to cancel and replay by local rule. All right, so now let's uh, look at the decisions. Uh, decision 33-1-1, uh, which talks about, if you think about it, it's kind of an odd, the facts are a little odd. Uh, a condition of a stroke play competition provides that scores must be returned by 7.30 p.m which, you know, to some degree begs the question, of, well, whatever happened to as soon as possible under Rule 6-6? <laughs> so I don't know the background for this, whether it's with a shotgun starter, they're trying to define very narrowly what as soon as possible means. Um, 
At five o'clock, a member of the committee extended the deadline to accommodate four late arriving competitors. Is such an action proper? Uh, no. Once, and, and this is the helpful part, the second uh, sentence of the answer. Once a competition has started, the conditions should be altered only in very exceptional circumstances. Not just exceptional, but very exceptional circumstances. So that is uh, something to keep in mind when faced with uh, something uh, during play. That takes a lot to change the conditions of competition once play has begun. And again, with the thinking being that players have a right to know when they tee off what, what the deal is, what, what, their, uh, what the format is, and so forth. See, so, yeah, 33-1-8. You know, I think this is just an interesting reminder that the rules of golf themselves, the 34 rules, do not prohibit players from riding, riding in a cart during play. It's only by a condition of competition established by the committee that players could be prohibited uh, from doing so. And we'll see that uh, this summer with the, uh, with the uh, state amateur, uh, Aaron Hills. Uh, decision 33-1-11.5. And I know uh, uh, WSGA is very involved with high school and uh, college golf, so this uh, comes up a lot. Now, what is the status of a team captain or coach? Well, before we get to this decision, just uh, in the absence of any local rules or conditions of the competition. Uh, well, it, if the committee adopts the condition of competition authorizing a coach to each, or each team to have one person to give advice, that which uh, then a coach may do so, but what's his status? For example, what is the ruling if one of his players' balls strikes him, or if, say, he actually moves one of his players' balls, mm -hmm. or if he stands on an extension of the line of putt behind one of his players while the player's putting? Uh, is there any penalty in any of those situations to the player? And the answer to that is, before we get to this decision, the answer is no, because even though the coach is authorized to give advice, he is still an outside agency. So if an outside agency moves the player's ball, there's no penalty, uh, and the player would replace the ball. So if the coach is helping the player search for his ball in tall rough, coach kicks and moves it, no penalty, ball has to be replaced. Player hits an errant shot, strikes the coach, no penalty uh, under Rule uh, 19, and the uh, player would play the ball as it lies. So just because he's allowed to give advice does not mean does not mean that the coach assumes the status of a caddy or a partner. He remains an outside agency. But then we have this decision, which asks the question: May a committee specify that during the round the team captain or coach is part of the match or part of the competitor's side, i.e., he is not an outside agency? And the answer is yes. Uh, the committee may adopt such a condition. And in uh, such circumstances, uh, the player or team would be responsible for any breach of the rules by the captain or coach. So if the committee were to adopt such a condition and then the coach kicks the player's ball while helping him search for it in tall rough, then the player would be penalized, uh, one stroke under Rule 18-2A. Uh, and there, so there, there's, some good, there's some good and bad uh, in pros and cons for adopting such conditions. Because if you do so, then it means the coach has to be more careful, which makes, I think, people more comfortable with the role of the coach giving advice. But on the other hand, there could be some unintended consequences in that, for example, what if, um, you know, say at uh, Aaron Hills, on a coach is in the 10th fairway or in the left rough of number 10 helping his player with club selection in a Another player on the team on number 11, it's a wild hook. He comes over and actually hits the coach uh, in the, uh, on the 10th hole. Well, then that player on number 11 is going to have a penalty stroke, and that seems a little uh, odd. Uh, and also what's interesting is there can be some situations where it can be difficult to figure out how to apply a penalty when a coach does something he's not, not allowed to do. And that, for example, what if uh, once the players are on the course, the coach goes, and there is not, repeat, not a local rule in effect allowing distance measuring devices, and the coach goes out and starts using a distance measuring device. How, how, and how do you apply that penalty, and where do you apply that penalty? That can be uh, 
you know, that, that can be difficult to figure out. So th there are some pros and cons. I'm curious, has anyone here ever adopted this condition, making the coach part of the player's side? Yeah. I, this question is probably for Bill, but I've sort of forgotten. How does the WIA uh, do that when you see boys and girls do They do it half the You go ahead. Well, it seems they don't do it quite right because they have this comes up all the time. The coach stands directly behind the player in the fairway. Mm -hmm. And then you tell them if they can't do it, and you look at 14 2 to B or A or B, and you and say, well, that only applies to a caddy or a partner. The coach is not either. And then the WIA says, well, we've told the coaches they can't do it. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then you say to them, uh, not that the rules of golf prohibit you, you say, I'm sorry, the WIA doesn't allow. Oh. Behind the player, and then the coach generally uses it. So, is the coach treated as an outside agency? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying they try to have it both ways. They try well, to say it's an outside agency, but yeah. for this particular, you can't do, do this. Yeah. In High school golf is usually very lax mm -hmm. on local rules and conditions of the competition. and marking the course ironically. <laughs> um, it, I, I've mentioned this to the Golf Coaches Association many times that their coaches have a responsibility and uh, oftentimes that responsibility is not met and clarifying the situation that you're talking about is usually not touched upon and therefore he's an outside agency if you don't say anything. Uh, that's my experience. And I know it's that NCAA's various divisions, men's and women's, have gone talk about this. But ultimately, I think the women have experimented with this, and I think they may have a, might be longer. I think they abandoned it after a year or two. Um, and th there must be a good reason for it. To, to make matters worse, the WI this year is allowing a second coach under the oh. conditions. Uh, to also offer advice, et cetera, and that will multiply the, the problem by two. There's a lobbying effort by the System Coaches Association of America. Well, actually, that was a big, it was a big deal when I think it was, I think it was for 2008, the note at the end of the late was changed to allow for a second person to be able to give advice. No significant lobbying by the NCAA uh, for that. Uh, is. <laughs> for example, the coaches are going and picking up loose impediments in the mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, inadvertently or for whatever reason, or just forgetting that their, one of their players might be behind there or might aid one of their players that's playing in the same group or whatever. You know, what do you think of it? So, Outside yeah, I, and what's nothing. difficult, and it's a good question, what if the player's ball lies in a hazard and this coach goes in and starts removing loose impediments from around it, something the player himself I think he's only allowed in the bunkers to clean up the bunker after the players. You're, you're right, and sometimes in some conditions of competition, they limit where a coach can go. For example, I've you seen cases where they say you can't go on the putting green or you can't go uh, in, in a hazard. But, you know, let's say that if if that restriction is not in effect and the coach does go into the hazard and start removing loose impediments. I, you know, I think we can say that if that's done with the player's knowledge and the player doesn't stop him uh, from doing so, especially around his ball, I think you could say the player's in breach. But if the coach is doing this while the player's walking 270 yards up, you, know, you can't really penalize the player and, doesn't, and I, it doesn't quite seem right. And it's a, it's a difficult situation. I'm not sure there's a perfect answer. We have a question online. It says, could John explain why a player on the 11th hole would be penalized if a player on the 10th hole strikes the coach on 11? And I think he has that somewhat reversed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, the example I had was that the, play, the coach was with a player on hole number 10, and the player on hole number 11 tees off and hits the coach. It doesn't hit his teammate. hits his coach on hole number 10. That if the uh, condition in this decision were in effect and the coach uh, was, was deemed to be part of the player's side, part of the, uh, each player's side, 
then uh, the player on hole number 11 would incur a penalty stroke for strike efforts having his ball deflected by a uh, number of side under rule 19 2. So, all right. Uh, John, I have a question yeah. on uh, decision 33 1 slash 8. Okay. Yeah, uh, cart, may a player use a cart during competition? Uh, I think it was 1979, we had a state amateur at Los Angeles. And the only, it was the first time we had a public golf course to use. Yeah. And the only condition that they would allow us to use a golf course is the player had to use a golf cart. Oh. That was the financial uh, oh, okay. go for it. So now the question is if the player refused to use a golf course or abandoned a golf course along the way, play, what would be the penalty? Well, and the question is uh, occasionally you come across a situation where the golf course, whether it's for revenue purposes or for pace of play concerns, requires players to take a cart. Uh, how do you apply that if a player refuses to uh, use a cart? And I think uh, if you were asked the USGA that, they would probably say, well, the rules of golf don't authorize such a condition of competition, therefore, the rules of golf aren't going to have an answer, and neither are we. Um, so I, I think, <laughs> so I, which uh, doesn't help necessarily when that actually happens, because I have heard of many cases where, where that, that's the case. Uh, and so I think it's up to each committee to decide. And I would say that that's an example where, as the committee, you need to spell that out um, but beforehand, one way or the other. Um, and I don't know if you try to apply the thinking behind the transportation condition to say, okay, if you don't use, if you don't use a cart, the penalty is two strokes for each hole, maximum of penalty four, four strokes for the round. And then when you realize you're in breach, then you have to start riding <laughs> in the cart uh, or you're disqualified. I you know that that could be a way, way to look at it uh, to write a condition for that. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think we put it could be possible disqualification for mm -hmm. failure to apply mm -hmm. uh, by the rule. And we had a group that was uh, using cards, and they were in the top 10 players, you know, uh, top 10. And they just said, we refuse to use a card because that's not the way to golf. And no place in the rules of golf does it say, you know, da 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 da. And so, uh, you know, I'll get down and say, guys, please, <laughs> please, you know, would you do this like that? And, uh, uh, because if it continues, you could have possibly be disqualified as said to the rule. It doesn't say it will be, but it say, could be. That's the way we put it. With the loose. That Dan, was that you involved? Yeah. Just, just curious. Yeah. Were you one of the players? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounds yeah. like something yeah. you would say, yeah. though. Yeah. Oh, oh, say, look, oh, there's nothing oh, in the rules of golf that can yeah. require yeah. me to ride in a cart. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I think Frank, what you did, what that approach was very pragmatic because it allowed you basically to warn players, mm -hmm. you know, to warn them, and then if it happens again, disqualify. Which, yeah. uh, in continuation of that same decision, I was playing in a state qualifying, uh, state open qualifying. First time they ever had a qualifier before that. And I was playing, a, I think it was at Dredska Park or something like that. And one of the conditions is that you either had to use a golf cart or have a caddy. I think that was the, uh, the rule I had. Now, I had arranged for a caddy to come, and he didn't show, uh, whatever reason. I had that day. So I carried my bag down for the first three holes and he finally arrived and he met me and when we got done, I think I shot like a 74 and I, you know, qualified, yeah, like that. And they said, oh, wait a minute now, just a minute. You didn't have a caddy. You know, you carried your bag. That was a, against the rules like that. Therefore, uh, we're going to penalize you two strokes for every hole that you carry. And then they said, the maximum will be six strokes. <laughs> and so I got a six stroke penalty which turned my 74 into uh, whatever failure to qualify. Yeah. I didn't want you in it. That's right. <laughs> no, I, I, th I think I mean, that you know, raises a very good point. Whenever a committee, uh, sometimes sometimes a committee is forced to adopt an unusual condition of competition. And the important thing is that the committee uh, say, you know, be as explicit up front, mention the, poss the penalty, possible penalty, and so forth. And that, for example, if a, if if it lost Sony in 1979, if you just read written, players must ride in carts, period, and that's it. 
then you know no one knows what the consequence is. And you have a very hard time penalizing players when you didn't state what the pen, what the penalty would be. It's a little bit like and that's one reason um, uh, it, uh, the whole issue with cell phones can be touchy. That some uh, clubs or associations will say use of cell phones prohibited. Period. We had a situation. And the question, and if, if if that's all they write on, say, the local rule sheet, the question that is, okay, so if someone does use a cell phone. What happens? And there's a, and the USGA will say, well, you really can't or shouldn't penalize somebody under rule, the rules of golf for that. And they're really in a, a, a condition of competition, penalizing people using someone for just using a cell phone to make a phone call is not uh, authorized. So a lot of people look at that as a disciplinary uh, matter, you know, which I think makes sense, somewhat similar to a dress code issue. Uh, something like that, but um, it's, you know, having just statements prohibiting something without stating what the consequence would be if someone doesn't follow that is, it can be a mess. Mm -hmm. We had a situation, we had a situation last year at the Irish course where we required players to use a cart, but it was cart path only. Oh. So one player would tee off, take his golf clubs off the cart, and walk to his ball, and when he'd get to the green, he'd put his clubs back on the cart, <laughs> and he'd go from green to tee in the cart. So basically, he was speeding up play. And so how does this cart move along? Oh, just because the other person <laughs> sharing it? There's two people. No, okay. the remote control. <laughs> <laughs> his, 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 his fellow, his, his cart partner was stuck with the cart. Yeah, was but, I mean, it, you know, so we just didn't do anything, but it would, it was a good laugh. Everybody watched it. You know, it was it was a stick out. Well, right, you're right, because I, you know, that raises the question of obviously what's considered to be using the cart. Is this player considered to met that condition? And it probably makes sense to say he has. That's what we did. Uh, so, I mean, I see two different issues with the cart. One is where the course requires it because they want the revenue. So if the person pays for it, and they don't want to use it. I'd say that's entirely on the <coughs> Where we require a cart would be a case of play issue. There's long distances between holes or something like that. So wouldn't you just say if you choose not to use your cart, you're still subject to the pace of play. So you can get a warning, you get a penalty, you can qualify, you continue to hold the play. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I would not uh, you know want you know, I think it's a bad idea for a committee ever to require the use of a cart, but rather, you know, every to do everything it can, as you said, to encourage the use of a cart. So guys, there's this is a long golf course, lots of uh, lot of distance between holes, and you know we strongly encourage you to ride in a cart. And if you don't ride in a cart, remember you're going to be subject to the same pace of play uh, policy as everyone else, and you're not going to have any extra slack uh, cut to you because you've chosen to walk. Um, and and go, go with it from there. Okay. A question that comes up in our tournaments that has stemmed historically is the use of carts when they're not mandated. And what I mean by that is uh, in carts, in a tournament where carts are not mandated, could a player use the cart to go forward to oh. survey what he may not be able to see ahead of him? Oh, okay. Can a committee put a restriction on the use of carts if they're optional, I, I, I think it. And there is a decision in here. Is it under 33-8? I believe toward the start. Um, yeah, 33-8 slash four has a suggested local rule, and it's similar. And what the USGA uses in its two senior amateur championships, which allow carts, is uh, Probably, if, if not identical, it's very, very similar to what's in, in that decision. It's uh, helpful because it gets into the whole business of other people uh, driving the cart, sharing the cart, riding the cart, which can have create some real complications rules-wise for determining you know, who's the caddy. Do you ever have two caddies and so forth? And that's why that decision is uh, is so strict. But Bill's uh, question dealt with that that you see in some. Competitions allow carts is uh, the committee will say okay you can ride in the cart but 
it can't ride beyond your ball for scouting purposes or something like that. And sometimes, in my sense, is committees will do that either for pace of play and or not to give cart riders an advantage over walkers. That's primarily. So, and, you know, I, I think could a committee restrict the movements of the cart in such a way? They could, but I would be hesitant, hesitant to do so just because, you know, I, I think from a simplicity perspective, once you make the decision to allow carts, just allow everything that comes with them. And there can be situations where a player might, you know, drive up ahead for legitimate reasons, see if the landing area is clear, uh, you know, to watch a fellow, fellow competitor play, to keep an eye on his ball, and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm just not the whole... I'm just not that concerned about it. If, if the concern really is that, well, he'd have an advantage over the walker, then I think you'd argue, well, then the walker should have taken a cart. You know, the walker made the decision not to have that. Um, and uh, so you know, that, that situation occurred to us. Uh, we allowed the use of golf carts in the state amateur tournament because prior to that, it was walking or caddy or so forth. And it was at Westmore Country Club. And then the ninth hole at Westmore Country is a long par five. And it had, before it was renovated, it had a hill. You could not see the, for a long hitter, you could not see the green. And so uh, one of our previously long hitters named John Pallon uh, was riding a cart. And he had a really long tee shot out there, probably 300 plus yards or something like that. And so he could reach, the, one of the few guys in the tournament could reach that green in two about it. And so there was an enormous crowd behind the green watching the activity. And all of a sudden you saw this cart pop up over the hill and it was John Pallon looking, surveying the green because uh, he was going home in two. Yeah, and so he then went back and sure enough, his ball, you know, with a three iron, just like it went on the green. But everybody said, hey, we had a rule. You could not survey beyond uh, the, your ball. That was the rule. And, and I think the, cop, the, the uh, penalty was like two strokes or something like that. For, and then the bench continues, you can maybe just fall the paper. And so, uh, they came to me and said, you know, hey, there he is. He's, he's surveying, you know, the advance of his tee shot. And I said he was doing it for safety reasons like that, and therefore I didn't see any penalty to apply. I, I really got criticized, you know, by a lot of spectators and so forth for failure to apply a penalty in that condition. But it was for safety reasons in my uh, decision. Yeah, I, I think I can understand the desire, but I think it opens up a can of worms and I would just as soon say once you make the decision allow cards just allow it to so worry from about a that. practical standpoint what has happened over the years is that the players have come to accept this and the only time that they do go beyond their ball is for the purpose of seeing if it's safe to play okay and it's interesting because what happens if carts are mandatory they still ask the same question. No. And we say, no, if everybody's on a cart, you can go wherever you want. So I, my point is it's working the way we have ascribed it. It's working. Yeah, this, you know, I, I, I would, while I you know, hate the idea of encouraging people to use carts, on the other hand, it's somewhat analogous to distance measuring devices. Let's say that you have a local rule allowing range finders. You know, people who have a rangefinder will have an advantage over people who don't have a rangefinder, right? And if you allow carts, then people with carts possibly will have an advantage over walkers in some cases. And but that's a decision the walkers made. Uh, you know, they, they they chose not to have that same potential advantage, and I leave it at that. No, we in, in my period of time uh, never penalized anybody for cart use. I'm sure there were violations of our rules like that that never applied. <laughs> I'm just wondering if Bill, have you ever had to apply a cart penalty? I'm just curious. Well, no, it comes up, and this is an interesting discussion, <laughs> which I think we'll need to rewrite our cart rules. Uh, you know, in listening to you, obviously, we should not have a restriction at all if we allow carts in their optional sense. Plus I'm more concerned in the mandatory oh. sense that you referred, spelling out penalties oh. for not using them, and I think we should follow that local rule. Is that how you would see it? Yeah. But I agree with Ken. I think people, practically speaking, in, in use, 
don't use the cart to scout. It's more of a safety issue. Yeah. You know, it, if you allowed cart at Aaron Hills, you know, a guy might on the 12th hole want to drive up or the 11th hole would be a better example, drive from, say, the back tee up to see what's mm -hmm. down in the landing area. Is he scouting or is he seeing if no one's in the landing area? You know, I, I guess maybe I'm being naive, but just in daily play, you know, non-tournament play, how often do people really drive ahead for scouting purposes? No. Well, we have a whole for, hidden for, glen. We have a whole hidden two holes of hidden glen where you actually have to do this in order to find out where the hole is. And um, and and in one case, the hole goes straight uphill. So what we do is guide, and most of our players walk. What we do is we just pick the guys up and drive them up to the top okay. of the hill. But you can't play the hole without going up there. Yeah, because I, I could imagine, you know, a hole like, say, the second at Lawsonia on the Lynx course where a player drives up to the top of the hill first and foremost to see if it's clear, but also, you know, you know while he's up there, he's going to probably try to figure out what his line is. So what do you do? He's gone up there for two reasons. You know, how do you rule? And that, that can be tough. Um, uh, the USDA. <laughs> yeah, all right. What was the Casey Martin, okay, yeah. right, the mm -hmm. USA, and then uh, not the Lala What if somebody uh, said, hey, Casey, you want to even know he's got court order, say you could do it or something like that, but I'm going to ride in this cart now. What would have been the penalty in the U in US Open play? If someone somebody else? used the cart for whole X. Oh, well, that, well that, that, so someone not authorized to use a cart did. Well, then you have the. Uh, uh, penalty statement or the condition in Appendix One, and I believe it's two strokes per hole, maximum of four holes, then you have to stop. I remember that happened. The most famous example I can think of was in a qualifier for the U.S. Open back in maybe the 80s. That happened to Roger Malfi, and he uh, received the full penalty and uh, just didn't occur to him that he wasn't allowed to ride. Even, you know, and he didn't notice he was the only person on the golf course <laughs> riding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. And, and with the decisions in 33, we, while there are a number we won't go over, and you can tell there are a lot of decisions under Rule 33, uh, it's very good for committees. For example, thir the decisions under 33-2A provide guidance on about marking a course and so forth. And here, here's one that, that makes an interesting point, 33-28-16, where, say, a committee uh, is using a stone wall uh, for out-of-bounds. May the committee say that the out-of-bounds, the ball's not out-of-bounds until it's beyond the wall. And what's interesting with this is that it points out the fact that there's nothing in the definition of out-of-bounds that states what part of a wall defines out of bounds. So if you have a wall defined out of bounds, you have to say in the local rules which does the inside face or the outside face define out of bounds. Because with boundary stakes, definition takes care of that. The nearest the inside points at ground level. Uh, in the fence post, the definition takes care of it, but the uh, definition is silent <laughs> about uh, boundary walls. So just something Keep in mind if you have ever come across a uh, boundary wall for out of bounds. Now, decision 33 2A 19 at the bottom of that page is a good one uh, to know uh, in that it's a, a situation that can arise and also it emphasizes uh, in stroke play how important it is that everyone plays essentially the, the same uh, course. So let's uh, go through the decision. Stroke play of boundary line has been altered through the unauthorized removal of a boundary stake. So there's an area, X, which is in bounds if the removed stake is disregarded and out of bounds if the removed stake is replaced. And it could be a spectator removed it, could be a homeowner uh, removed it, uh, so we don't know. But all we know is that there's supposed to be a stake, there's, is that there's a missing uh, stake. A's ball comes to rest in this area. He is aware that the boundary has been altered. He asked the committee for ruling. What should the committee do? Well, the committee should replace the boundary stake, i.e. restore the original boundary line and require him to proceed under stroke and distance, unless 
the committee knows that one or more preceding players had an ignorance of the fact that the stake was missing played from area X. In that case, the committee should allow the altered boundary line to stand for the remainder of the competition, not just for the round, but for the competition, and A would play his ball as it lay. Then uh, second question, what would be the ruling if the, chairman, the committee determined one or more had an ignorance uh, of the fact that the stake was missing, played from area X, and one or more had treated knew that the stake was missing and had treated the area as out of bounds and therefore proceeded under stroke and distance. Well, if the incon and then it's an interesting answer, if the inconsistent treatment could significantly affect the result of the competition, the round should be canceled and replayed, otherwise the round should stand. So this is interesting <laughs> where to some degree they're almost saying, well, okay, if the leaders had in treated us inconsistently, then we were concerned. But if the players in the bottom of the field treat it different ways, we're not going to worry that much about it, which is almost surprising to see. But it's, <laughs> a, uh, but it's also something that uh, uh, term administrators like to see because it gives them something to uh, point out in the decisions both to, uh, to angry players, angry parents, <laughs> and so forth, to say, well, in my eyes, this did not significantly affect the result of the competition. Because, as you can imagine, as a tournament administrator, just about the last thing you want to have to do is cancel and replay a slow play round. And that is a huge, huge pain in the neck uh, in terms of course availability, scheduling, and just everything for everybody, for the players, for the officials, for the golf course. <laughs> so, uh, so you want uh, uh, that is usually just an absolute uh, last resort. I have a question. Uh, there's a decision or local rule, I can't remember, that talks about when you use stakes and lines, a committee could declare the out-of-bounds stakes that identify out-of-bounds, but that do not find the margin to be obstructions. Can you kind of elaborate on the situations in which you might do that? Well, it's interesting. The definition of out of bounds states that if, if you use a line to define out of bounds, just like with a hazard, the line itself defines uh, out of bounds. And if there are stakes identifying, just so people know from a distance that there is a boundary there, that the stakes themselves are not obstructions. However, the definition does, does go on to say that a committee may, by local rule, as Bill said, deem those boundary stakes to be uh, obstructions. Uh, would a committee want uh, to do that? I, my sense is I would be reluctant to do so in part because I think pretty much players are not allowed to remove boundary stakes. So it then might confuse them for that round and rounds at other courses, and they might mistakenly move, mm -hmm. remove a boundary stake down the road. But that is, I suppose you could have a case where maybe there need to be so many boundary stakes that the player could get a really bad break in the eyes of the committee. If he, uh, I've never done it, but I was wondering the situation that might call yeah. for it. Well, because, and what, what the story behind that definition is that you know, before that definition was changed for, I think it was 2008, uh, maybe 2004, 2008, that the rules were silent about boundary stakes that only identified out of bounds. So therefore, since they didn't define out of bounds, they were obstructions. So this was a, fa a fairly common method for marking courses, say overseas, where you might have a gravel-filled trench as the boundary line and the occasional white stake, but the trench was actually what defined out of bounds, and the stakes therefore didn't define out of bounds. So by default, they were obstructions and, and could be moved, which you know really kind of just blew some people's minds uh, in, in this country. But then thought that wasn't quite right, so. Uh, that, then that was kind of flip-flopped in the definition. But uh, it's hard for me to imagine a case where that would be a good idea, both for short-term and long-term reasons. Uh, Along that line, Jim, um, at Maple Bluff, we have a lot of cedar fences that border the golf course. Mm -hmm. And they're not straight. They'll, you know, they'll come on, they'll go into the course a little bit and then come back okay. out the penny, trees, whatever. And the stakes are off the ground by about five <coughs> inches, hmm. attached 
to the fence posts. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I believe the fence posts become, that line becomes the out of bounds. So you can go in towards the course and then back out. And this one that's, that maybe is in towards the center of the golf course doesn't have a stake on it. This one down here does. So you can be, you can, the guy might line and say, well, I'm in bounds, but actually he's not. All right. Yeah. And it comes up when we play there all the time. Online question, which I think is, is an easy one to answer. What is the ruling if a player moves a boundary, boundary stake? Is it similar to the decision regarding T markers? Thank you. Okay, yeah. With the question is, what if a player removes a boundary stake? and therefore is altering the uh, dimensions of the course. Sure. Uh, is that similar to that decision? I think it's 11-2 slash 2 about a player who relocates a tee marker, and there are various situations where there's no penalty if the player replaces it before someone plays, and uh, where there's disqualification or two strokes and depending on the circumstance. So I think in this case with a boundary stake, it uh, somewhat similarly will depend on the circumstances. For example, if a player um, plays a ball from near a boundary stake, hits a bad shot, then anger takes a swipe at the boundary stake and breaks the boundary stake or sends it flying. Uh, you know, I, even if he doesn't replace it, I don't think we would um, apply a penalty. Uh, the only time I think we'd apply a penalty would be if a player mo uh, moves or removes a boundary stake for the purpose of altering the uh, dimensions of the course then I think you would say that's such a serious action that he, the player should be disqualified under Rule 33-7. Even if he replaces the stake before he plays? Oh, well, I, no, if, if he replaces it, then I'd say that's okay. But let's say if he removes it for the purpose of changing the boundary line, mm -hmm. and he then tosses it in the trees, is it, you know, if he's upset saying that this should not be out of bounds or, or, or this should be out of bounds, whatever the case may be, and he does it for that purpose, you know, for, for the purpose of affecting players behind him, then I think it makes sense to disqualify. But if he takes it out and then he puts it back, that would just be a two-stroke penalty? Well, if, if he takes it out and puts it back, would that be a two-stroke penalty? Well, it will depend on the circumstances, that if he if it's a Rule 13-2 situation, you know, does the stake, say, interfere with his area of intent swing or something like that, then that, that would be a two-stroke penalty. Even if he puts it back before he plays the stroke. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, the re reason being yeah. is he's penalized for even if he replaces it before a stroke, because as soon as he moves that stake, he's improved his line of play or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had a situation similar to that. Where, uh, I think it was at Rolling Meadows in, in uh, Conlac, and the tempo, and he was an out of bounds par five, and it was uh, out of bounds to the left, and it sort of zigzagged. And there was a white stake on it uh, to identify the zigzag and so forth. Didn't have lines, just stakes. And apparently there was a traffic pattern where kids would walk this way from going to school or whatever it was. And one of them picked up one of the bounty and replaced it in a different area. <laughs> and a leader of the tournament, the name Brian Kavak, was going to hit a ball into that area. And he went in and he said, Oh, this shouldn't be out of bounds. They hit it. And then one of our officials, who was unfamiliar with the court, came back and said, Well, you're out of bounds. You're a white stake. And it was had been misplaced. Like that. And uh, so the player says, well, I know the course. I go on here like that. And that stake should have been over there. It's in the wrong place like that. And the official said, You play by the way the court is marked. That stake is here like that. And so there's a confrontation job, between the right. official and the player. And the Player just he uh, said, "Well, if you have to, I'll play two balls." And the official says, "You're out of bounds. You don't have to play two balls. If you strike this ball, you're going to be disqualified." So on. Now this is the official part. Came to uh, and the player went ahead and played and just ignored the official. And then they came up and uh, presented to me. So we took a ride out there and I said, "Well, you're right." I placed the stake, I found it, and it was in the wrong spot. Should have been here. Therefore, uh, your ball was in play. I mean, it should have been like that. And so we fired the official. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, and then that, that is a tough case of so how do you treat that everybody, players and officials, are used to playing the course as they find it. So how do you treat a situation where a stake's not where it's supposed to be? And it can have big consequences. And as, as Bill was saying, 
that's exactly why uh, the USGA does it, its events and recommends it others that when it marks out of bounds with stakes, that it uh, puts a little white circle around the base of the stake so that uh, if the stake is, that one, that's a way of saying this is where the stake is supposed to be. And that two, if a stake is removed, then you can tell where it's supposed to be. We didn't do that, but that's yeah. a good recommendation. Yeah. Can I get your general feeling on one subject, which I've always wondered in marking courses? Let's say the right side of a hole is dead straight and there are stakes up the right side. Clearly, uh, you can see from stake to stake quite well. Okay. In that instance, there would be no reason whatsoever to paint a line. Would you agree with that? Uh, so, so the question is straight hole, and you have a nice row of white stakes down the right-hand side, is there any reason to paint a line? You know, in some cases there can be. For example, what if along the right-hand side you have a bunch of houses? And, you know, as we've all found out probably the hard way, homeowners really, really don't like the look of white stakes in their front or backyard. And, uh, and often, you know, go out next morning and boom, all of a sudden stakes are missing and the homeowners come out and remove the stakes. And so that might be a case where maybe you'd paint a line just uh, because the homeowner uh, isn't going to remove the white line. So that would probably be the only time I would uh, consider doing it in a case like that. Um, John, can I revert back to the committee question on, okay. on uh, conditions of play? Uh, many years ago, uh, our student leader, uh, President of the Lake Don Johnson, instituted a uh, ruling that we would have to play for all of our events uh, not to use shorts. We could have to play with uh, long trousers. And uh, we had a qualifier for the USGA Open at Maple Bluff. And uh, so that was our rule in the state of Wisconsin, you know, that and so forth. So when we sent out the pairing sheet to the players, we put this rule in there and suggested, hey, you know, guys, shorts are not allowed, you know, in Wisconsin, blah, 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 blah. And so a guy comes up from Seattle, Washington to play in the event. His name happened to be Freddie Couples, and he had shorts on. And he said, I didn't, I didn't get anything in my mail. I was traveling, playing in this event and so forth. So this, he said, I called in to see what my tea time was and so forth. And, and so he arrived. And it was like 85 degrees or something like that, and he had shorts on. And I came up and I said, uh, you know, there's a couple of, uh, would you mind changing, you know, Tim, because this is our rule. And, you know, he just defiantly said, uh, no. And uh, I, uh-oh, you know, uh, yeah. so now the question, you know, he said, I entered the U.S. Open qualifying uh, uh, tournament like that, and no place did it say that I couldn't wear shorts no matter where I played. And I said, you're right. But this is Wisconsin and you're here, and we had this ruling like that. And he said, I'm playing. You can call USD headquarters. I go, oh. So I did. And I ended up, I don't know, Jeff Hall, I talked to somebody like that, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't have, no, Tom Mead, Jeff Hall. We do not have a ruling like that, and therefore he, you have to allow him to call. And so he played, and he qualified, naturally, and I got a lot of heat. From other players and like that because it was 85 degrees and like that and uh, it was a dumb uh, I mean it was a rule that we had put in at the time and for many years and it was a tough ruling but well I, it's, it can be a touchy situation with dress code situations because for example, the language on the U.S. Open entry form regarding dress code is pretty generic it they they it does prohibit shorts at the championship proper but not in, at the qualifying sites. And it just requires people to be, I think it says neat with respect to grooming and appearance and something like that. Because then the question comes up, what if the qualifier is being held at the club and the club has its own dress code? Like, you know, there's some places, I don't know if it's still the case, like say Baldasrol doesn't allow shorts, men to wear shorts. Uh, and what if there's a qualifier there, you know, would the USGA uh, honor the club's dress code for the qualifier. And I'm, I'm not sure what the USJ would say. I think there's a fair chance they'd say they'd say they would uh, honor that. Um, but if they do so, you know, as you said, the key is to tell players up front. Uh, I think so they know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. 
but I, I would be somewhat, I'd be hesitant to impose a WSGA dress code. I think a club dress code is a little bit different. Remember down at Sneakland, the kid from Rockford came up, a short sign. Mm -hmm. This is when we had pants only. And uh, he just went and grabbed his rings bottom out of his and it was hotter than hell. Uh, we have a comment and a question. Okay. The comment uh, is regarding the dress code, and I'm glad it's a woman commenting on this particular thing, but the woman states, I had to tell Natalie Galbus that her skirt was too short. Uh, I know as a man, I wouldn't touch that one. Uh, but more importantly, <laughs> Or at least on another subject, we have a question, what takes precedence, white stakes or white lines? And when the white line has been worn in some areas and is not clearly identifiable, okay. could you comment on that? Yeah, if you do have white stakes and white lines, then it's similar to the water hazard situation. The white line will take precedent over the stakes. And if the line has uh, been worn and is not clear, then unfortunately you start to run into a situa situation where the rules won't necessarily have clear answers for you. Because the rules say if you have both, the line takes precedent over the stakes for determining exactly where the boundary line is. And if the line is inconsistent, then the rules aren't, aren't going to have an answer for you. It'd be the same as same as what do you do if part of a hazard line is missing or has become worn. You know, you do the best you can uh, in, in a bad situation uh, to figure it out. Well, that comes up when you have uh, two events from different organizations a week apart. Mm -hmm. The first one will mark it, now it's faint. Well, the second group, they should go out and definitely reinforce it. Mark, mark yeah. the faint one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point, Arnold, because that's, that's where it happens. And yeah. so, or sometimes with that second event, you might even say disregard painted lines. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. and say we're only going by stakes for this event. Um, Let's see, moving on through Rule 33. Uh, decision 33-6-3 can come up, especially at uh, the USGA qualifiers that uh, we conduct that <coughs> often will end in a playoff for the final spots and so forth. And this actually, and I don't know the exact date or the history of this with relation to the 1962 U.S. Open uh, playoff between Nicholas and Palmer, where many people remember his 18-hole playoff. They get to the final green, and it's clear Nicholas was going to win by two, three, or four strokes. And in a, in a gesture of sportsmanship, Palmer goes over, lifts Nicholas's ball marker, and shakes his hand, as if to say, you know, congratulations. And then Joe Dye, then the executive director of the USGA, rushes on to the green and says, no, 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 this is still stroke play, can't concede. So, uh, Jack, please replace your ball and go well, which he did. Uh, but so people, based on that, have it in their minds that, okay, no matter what, in stroke play, playoff, you have to hold well. Well, let, this decision tells us that's not always the case. If there's a stroke play playoff and one of them is disqualified or concedes defeat, it is not necessary for the other to complete the playoff uh, hole or holes to be declared the winner. So the important point with that is that it is possible, because it's still stroke play, you can't concede a specific stroke, you may concede defeat. So if Bill and I are in the playoff and I'm making a mess of a hole, and Bill lies on, on, is on the green in two and I lie five, five in a greenside bunker, I can just go over, shake his hand, say congratulations, and that's fine. Neither one of us has to finish out the hole, but I've conceded uh, the playoff uh, to Bill. Now, it goes on to say if there's a playoff involving more than two competitors and not all of them complete the playoff hole or holes, the order and qualified or decide to withdraw determines the result of the playoff. Uh, something you can have, especially with uh, late, uh, late in the evening with playoffs uh, racing the uh, setting sun. Uh, decision 33-7 slash uh, 4.5 uh, was a new decision that was then uh, revised, just something to be aware of. It's not as big an issue at uh, WSGA events, uh, because this often will 
often, but not always, will involve uh, television. But it's worth uh, knowing that it's there. A competitor returns a scorecard. It turns out the score for one hole was lower than actually taken because he did include a penalty, which he did not know he had incurred. There is discovered before the competition's closed. All right, well, rule 6 6D would say what? Players disqualified. Uh, and the uh, answer is generally that disqualification penalty must not be waived or modified. However, if the committee is satisfied the competitor could not reasonably have known or discovered the facts resulting in the breach, it would be justified in waiving the disqualification penalty and but still applying the appropriate penalty stroke or strokes. So for, let's look at the first uh, example here. Player makes a short chip shot from the greenside rough. He thinks it was a normal shot, doesn't think more about it. Uh, but then at, he signs and returns a scorecard, and the committee sees this close up, super slow motion video revealing that he actually double hit his ball. Well, in those circumstances, the committee could say that even though the, the player was the one making the stroke, he really couldn't have known the fact that he had double hit the ball just because it was barely detectable with this uh, high-tech uh, uh, replay. So in that case, the committee could waive the disqualification penalty under Rule 6-6D, but it's important to note that the play, uh, com player would receive the one-stroke penalty under Rule 14-4 for double hitting the ball. That the committee is not waiving the penalty the player incurred under that rule, but it is waiving the <laughs> disqualification penalty for the incorrect score. Let's see. And 33-8 is a good, uh, the decisions under that are good for a committee to flip through is they answer questions as to whether certain local rules are authorized. And also, in some cases, they will actually give the as we saw, see with 33-8-4 with the golf carts that we mentioned earlier, will give suggested language for the local rules. And believe me, as a committee, if you want to adopt a local rule, it's a very good idea just to copy that directly out of the decision or out of Appendix 1. Does you, does why? Does that way, if someone complains about it, gives you a hard time, you can say, look, this is what the USGA recommends we use and we're just following the USGA's recommendation. You know, granted, it's a little bit of, of passing the buck mm -hmm. and avoiding responsibility, but it's a good way to do it, in part because it helps also ensure a uniformity and consistency in competitions. Now, decision 33-8-13, local rule for ball deflected by power line. Uh, occasionally, you'll come across this. The key point with this decision well, there, there are two key points. That one, the player does not have the option to cancel and replay a ball that's deflected. That uh, that no matter. The second point is that it's a matter of fact uh, that the ball is canceled and replayed. So if a player hits a ball, it's deflected by the power line. The player plays the ball from where it came to rest. He is now playing from the wrong place. That he's required to play from where he just played from. Instead, he's not playing from there. So it's a wrong place uh, in breach of this local rule, and the committee has to decide in stroke play whether a serious breach is involved. Uh, decision 33-8-27 uh, just lets us know that in extreme cases where a uh, uh, bunker or bunkers just do not provide uh, adequate relief, uh, for a player with, uh, in terms of casual water relief, that the committee may um, say that those bunkers are ground under repair through the green, in which case the player may take relief outside the bunker. That's uh, in uh, rare, uh, very rare circumstances, hopefully. Uh, decision 33-8-35, local rule treating rough as a lateral water hazard. Often you'll hear uh, committees say, uh, or actually do, uh, for under the pretenses of helping pace of play, uh, treat, uh, say, tall rough or bushes, undergrowth, 
as a lateral water hazard rather than just as through the green with a stroke and distance penalty for lost ball. And this decision clarifies that the uh, committee may not uh, do so because those areas do not meet the definition of uh, lateral water hazard. What, what one was that? Uh, 33 8 slash 35. Very good. I, I, I prefer you doing so. Even there are some uh, prominent courses in this area <laughs> where, 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 where the uh, where the where I have to say even the starter will tell people to it's all test who is a lateral water hazard. <laughs> You're kidding, John. When Conway Farms first opened, they had the fescue was lateral water hazard. Conway Farms of all places. And what's interesting with that is think of in fact. Remember, there's a funny story back in I think it was 2011. Uh, Aaron Hills hosted the Midwest Cup, and the organizer wanted to treat the toll fescue as a uh, lateral water hazard. And I, you know, really argued against that, but he insisted that go on the local rule sheet and just said play the fescue as a lateral water hazard. And <laughs> I couldn't help but point out and say, wow, so you mean in the fairway you can't ground your club? What, 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 what do you mean? Well, our fairways are fine fescue. So if you're saying that's a lateral water hazard, you can't grind your club, can't move loose impediments. Well, that, that, uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. And but there are all sorts of problems with that, such as if you tree is a lateral water hazard, the player just hits the ball straight there off the tee. And then where did it last cross the margin? You know, over the front of the tee. So what have you accomplished? Then if you hit it in there, then you can't touch the ground, you can't remove loose impediments. What does that mean about playing a provisional ball and so on and so forth? And it's a, it's a mess. Let's see. Now, there's some, are there many courses in Wisconsin that have an environmentally sensitive areas? I was trying to remember, does the yes. bog have Horses some? Bay, rolling, rolling, okay. Black the Oaks. Oaks. The Oaks. Okay. Black when they put one in black on 13 and along the road. Just did it last year. Okay. I had a, a, a rule that he decided a state high school championship on an environmental sensitive area yeah. at Rolling Meadows in uh, Fondelac. Uh, I can't remember the configuration hall was a, their newest nine at that time. And a fellow mm -hmm. hit the ball and he had a lot of spin on it and it hit the green. Probably five feet in the hole, but spun back and it went down the incline into this water uh, sensitive area. And it was probably playable because but it was in definitely inside the water level like that. And it was fine anyway. Now the rule says you cannot enter into that area at all. So he had to take a penalty and go back to where he last struck it, dropped the ball, and then you know proceed. And he could have easily played the ball out of that, that situation. Uh, but he was disallowed to go in it because it was an environmentally sensitive. Yeah, right. And, and Gene's uh, example there shows, uh, you know, it's a really good case for showing why committees really should not mark an area as environmentally sensitive unless they basically have a gun put to their head by, by the government to do so. Because one, it's to the player's disadvantage. Because in this case, as Gene said, his player could easily play from that uh, wetland. And secondly, it, you know, it's contrary to the whole principle of playing the ball as it lies. And third, because the local rule for environmentally sensitive areas is very complicated. And it's not well understood by players or officials. So doing whatever you can to avoid uh, use of that is, uh, is uh, very uh, wise and encouraged. But if you do have to use it, just be aware that there are a handful of decisions here that are helpful uh, with that. We won't go into the details with that, but they're they're useful to know. So if you have to officiate at a course that has the essays, it's uh, a good idea to uh, uh, to look at these decisions. Initially, wasn't that an outside body supposed to require that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, the golf course. yeah. So it should be some sort of governmental agency like the DNR saying, hey, we don't want anybody in this area. Okay. And then that's why the local rule was there is that before, I think local rule went into effect or it was first appeared in Appendix 1 in 1996. And uh, before then, the concern was there was no authority in the rules for a committee to prohibit players from playing from a water hazard. 
so but the USG and RNA realized with the way things were going uh, that with environmental restrictions that there needed to be that option for a committee. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Gary. So, this is uh, Bill and John. So, how should we proceed when these sent as a WSA official to officiate Boysenville sectionals and we get to a course where the, the coaches who have their, uh, their seat for play deem tall grass necessity to be lateral water hazards, given this decision uh, 33 8. Okay, well, I, well that, that, that's a good and realistic question. You're going to officiate at a tournament. You show up there uh, that morning, you're looking over the local rule sheet, and you see they are treating all the tall rough as a ladder water hazard. What should you do? And that, that's a, a tough one because, um, uh, you know, if there's time, I, in an ideal world, you would lobby with the uh, committee to strike that provision from local rule sheet. And there's a fair chance they have not marked that area, those areas. But if they have marked it, then obviously you can't really unmark them, you know, in the first two times 30 minutes away. And that's a difficult situation, but if they say no, you know, we've got to stick with it, then you know, and I think all you can do is point out, say, okay, well, if we're going to treat those lateral water hazards, then that means that everything that comes with that comes with it. So in terms of touching the ground, uh, moving loose impediments, now there are no, uh, you know, in terms of you can't use the unplayable ball options for ball that's in the areas and so forth. And then I think as an official, if you're forced, you know, really to officiate that way, then treat, treat it as if it is a lateral water hazard. We Ryan Lander North. That's the we did that at a, you know, at a qualifier. When we first instituted the uh, scope of qualifying for the state amateur, we had a course uh, used out of Slocum. Uh, what's the name of it now? Willow Rock. Yeah, that's it. Willow Rock. And, and they had a new nine back there. And so they had a local rule sheet for all the players, the regular players. It said that every hole in the back nine has red stakes because it's lateral water has a left or right. Because it had trees and underbrush and things like that, no water. And so now we put out our local issue, and it said uh, disregard <laughs> red sticks because there were so many red sticks. We had to pull red sticks or cover or do something, and there was just too many disregard red sticks on holes number X, X, and so forth because there was some legitimate red sticks in that nine for and so forth. And a lot of the players would come and they would go in the pro shop and they would pick up one of those stack of rule sheets <coughs> and so they would proceed and you know they never read your rule sheet you know, like that really and so they go out and play and all of a sudden we had you know guys you know dropping the ball left and right because of the red stakes and we had to make one ruling uh you know penalty ruling after another because we referred to that yeah. yeah i didn't see that or i didn't read it said, well that's your problem you know and that, that, that's tough i mean in a situation like that that can, you know, really gives the importance of having a good starter, say like Ken, you know, who can tell each and every player something important, like disregard the red stakes uh, or something like that. Because uh, as you as you said, you really can't trust players to read what you give them. All right. Well, that's uh, Rule 33, which uh, interestingly enough took almost about as much time as Rule 20 did. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a, it's a good one. It's an important one for uh, committees, and there's a lot of material, especially in the decisions that we can go over. It's uh, definitely uh, worth a read for those, um, you know, especially who oversee tournaments or qualifiers. Any uh, questions on 33? I have yeah. one quick question. Do you think that 33 3 3 is 33 3? 30, is this about players arranging their own groups? Yes. 33-3 yeah. slash 3. Well, what's interesting, Dan, is with decision 33-3 slash 3 is maybe every single rules class I've ever taught, even though we never cover this during class, someone has asked about this decision with your, your very question, saying, is this consistent with rule 33-3? Uh, and it's interesting how people uh, uh, pick up on this. And, and I, in the, the con conflict or apparent conflict is certainly easy to understand. The rule says, hey, the committee has to decide starting times and arrange the groups. 
and the decision says, well, it's okay for the players to do so. So is this, so your question, which is a good one, is is this decision consistent with the rule? And I think the answer is yes, it is. And that really in such a case, what the committee is doing is ratifying what the players do and giving its final blessing. And then the committee saying, okay, these are the starting times in the groups. You know, it's as if we have a sign up sheet and all of us can sign up for the groups and starting times we want. And then the committee takes that sign up sheet, types it up, and says, here are the starting times and groups. So ultimately, the committee does authorize it. So I think that's okay. But I, I, you are far from alone in thinking there's a conflict. And I don't think I've convinced you that there's not. <laughs> <laughs> to give you an example of that, in our senior tour events, we get many requests for players to play with certain players. And I think that would be. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not to play with some, as the case may be. And, and we certainly try to accommodate where it's feasible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, any, uh, anything else on 33? If not, why don't we, hey, why don't we go through Rule 34 and then we'll uh, take a break. Uh, 34, which, which is a shorter rule. 34-1A, uh, match play. If a claim is lodged with the committee on Rule 2-5, so now remember back to six weeks ago or so, a decision should be given as soon as possible so the state of the match, if necessary, may be adjusted. So in other words, if uh, Bill and I are playing, we have a dispute on the third hole, I make a claim about something Bill did, and then we come across Ken, an official on number seven, then Ken should, if possible, give us a ruling at that time so we know the state of the match for the remainder of the round. Uh, but there's always a chance that Ken, Ken might say, all right, well, let us think about that, and I'll get back to you as soon as we have a decision, which could be three holes later, that what Ken should not say is, uh, you know, we'll sort it out when you finish, because then you know, knowing the status of the match, you know, really is important for in match play. And if a claim is not made in accordance with Rule 2-5, it must not be considered uh, by the committee. And often uh, committees can avoid unpleasant situations just uh, with that. So let's say Bill and I come to Ken all worked up about something that happened, and I'm saying, oh, Bill did this, that, and and Ken just said, and Ken just asked, well, John, you make a claim about that. I said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I told Bill I didn't think he was allowed to do that. Well, did you do anything else? Well, no. I mean, Bill knew I didn't like what, what, didn't approve of what he did. Ken can just say, well, you know, sorry, you haven't made a claim. Uh, enjoy the rest of your round. You know, whole stands is played. Now, uh, as we saw, both stroke play and match play, there's no time limit on applying the disqualification for breach of Rule 1-3 for agreeing to waive the rules. Uh, stroke play. Uh, while there are a number of exceptions here, the main thrust of this rule is just in that first sentence. A, a penalty must not be rescinded, modified, or imposed after the competition has closed you know, sort of a, a statute of limitations here. And the rule goes on to say the competition, competition is closed when the result has been officially announced or when you have stroke play followed by match play when the players teed off in his uh, first match. And sometimes you'll have a committee might uh, even further define when the competition is closed for example, by saying, I think at the Masters, for example, they say the competition is closed when the green jacket has been presented to the winner for the first time. Um, that's uh, trying to have as precise a definition as uh, possible. The exceptions to that are that a player is disqualified after the competition is closed in these four cases. If he had agreed to leave the rules, if he had returned a scorecard in which he had ordered a handicap that was higher than that to which he was entitled, um, uh, and he knew it was higher than that to which he was entitled. If he returned a score for any hole lower than actually taken for any reason other than failure to include a penalty that he did not know he incurred. So let's take that 
third example there. The Craig Stadler situation when he knelt on the towel in San Diego back in 1987. He had no idea that was a breach of the rules. What if the committee had not become aware of that breach of Rule 13-3 for building a stance until Monday after the competition closed? At that point, would there have been any penalty to Stadler? No, no because it, his score was lower but than he actually made, but the reason was because of his failure to include a penalty, he did not know he incurred. So in Stadler's case, no penalty. Now, what if in that situation, a now let's take a case where a player, um, let's say I'm playing and I make a four on a hole. I just hit uh, four shots, and I return a score for the hole, and there, there's, there are no rulings, no penalties, but my scorecard has a three for that hole, and I return the three. And the committee realizes this the, after the competition is closed. In that case, what would the ruling be? I would be disqualified because I returned a score lower than I actually made, and the reason for that uh, difference was not because of an unknown penalty, so I would still be uh, disqualified. Now, what, what's the ruling if a no, I, no, yeah, no, that would be a bad example. Uh, fourth case, if the player knew before the competition closed that he'd been in breach of a rule uh, for which the penalty is disqualification. So, some examples would be. Uh, making a stroke at the non-conforming club, practicing on the course before the round, uh, and so forth. And, and what's interesting with these last three uh, cases is there is a little bit of a time difference. You have several different time checkpoints. When the player returns a scorecard, and then when the competition closes. And that it's possible for, for a player, to, when let's say with the Stadler case, if when he returned his scorecard, he had no idea he'd breached a rule. But then, while he's in, let's say he thinks he won the tournament, while he's waiting for the prize presentation, you know, as he often does, he's flipping through his decisions book just to kill time, and he comes across that uh, decision under Rule 13-3. So between when he returned his scorecard and the close of competition, he actually learns that this is a breach. Well. Hopefully, what should he do at that point? Tell the committee, and the committee would just disqualify him under Rule 6-60. But what if he keeps his mouth shut, and then the competition closes, and then the committee becomes aware that he learned before the competition closed that he'd been in breach? Then he would be disqualified. Why do they allow to keep people from out in the general public and look at TV and phone one in, uh, phone a, a violation in. Okay. It seems to me that you're treating, well, in the Craig Statler case, I think that was a phone one. Take mm -hmm. If he had been um, in, in 35th place, mm -hmm. nobody would have ever seen it. And neither he nor the person that he was playing with thought it was a penalty because not only he's playing with a partner, and if he does that, that partner, that other that co-competitor would say, "Wait a minute, that's you. You just built the stance. That's a penalty." That co-competitor did not think it was a penalty, and that happens all the time for those people who are not on TV. Mm -hmm. Because their score is, you know, they're not near a leaderboard. So why do they allow that to happen? Because you're treating the people who are the leaders far differently than you're right. treating the people who are in the field but who are further down who, who never show up. On right. Field. Well, I you know, that, and that, that's a very good question. And what sometimes if, you don't have to be far down. You could be, you could be in fourth place. No. And if Tiger is in first place, you never see anybody but him. No. Well, and that's Which a good question. Crazy. The whole business of uh, call-ins with uh, people calling in saying, geez, I just saw Craig Stadler kneel on a towel. You know, that's a breach. He needs to be penalized. Uh, why, why is that permitted? And especially in stroke play with the rules, the rules concern themselves more with 
what happened rather than who says what happened. It's, it's a question of fact whether a player breached a rule and the rules don't concern really concern themselves with how the committee becomes aware of it. It's, and it is, as is often the case with the rules, it becomes a question of if you draw a line, where could you draw the line? So, for example, let's say you have the first player out on Sunday. The two players and there are uh, no names and there aren't any spectators. There's a walking score, there are caddies, and there are the marshals, but there are no spectators following them. Uh, so if a fellow competitor or a caddy saw a player breach a rule and report that to the committee, I think everyone would say, okay, fine, yeah, the committee should listen to that. So then the question is, okay, what if a volunteer, you know, what if a walking score or a marshal saw them do that? Should the committee consider that? Eh, probably. You know, they saw it themselves. Makes sense. So then let's say now you have somebody in the middle of the pack. That now there are a few spectators around, and a spectator saw something and reported that to the committee. And remember the definition of referee. A referee shall act on any breach of a rule that's reported to him. So he's obligated to look into it and say, hey, did, Craig, did you really kneel on a towel back there on 14? So if a spectator can do that, okay. Then, you know, how, in theory, how different is it if a spectator tells the committee, informs the committee of a possible breach versus, say, a television viewer? You know, and this isn't, shouldn't really the important part be, did he kneel on the towel, rather than, well, how did the committee learn about that? Just think about the uproar that could occur. It obviously say a player like Tiger Woods inspires very strong emotions on both sides. And imagine, a, uh, you know, for example, with uh, what happened with Tiger at the Masters, uh, with, with uh, David Eager, a very good player and a former USGA and PGA Tour rules official, uh, got a hold of the Masters tournament committee saying, hey, I don't think Tiger dropped as near as possible when he was proceeding under stroke and distance. If the committee disregarded that phone call and they looked at, or, and, but then they knew that, you know, David was right. He did not, he played from the wrong place, but they told the world, yeah, but we know Tiger played from the wrong place, but there's no penalty. Imagine what the uproar uh, would be from that. If, uh, when everybody knows Tiger breached the rule, but just because it was reported by a television viewer, there's not going to be a penalty. And that would, uh, I think, upset a lot of people, just as people are upset when people are penalized when people call in. But that's what they did. Yeah, it, but I, 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 they I, did that. But I, 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 yeah, and, but I think part of the benefit of allowing call-ins is it frankly encourages players to get things right when they return their scorecards. That with if call-ins were not permitted to be considered, then you could indirectly foster an atmosphere where players are a little less careful, where they think, well, as long as I'm not on television, or as long as nobody, since television viewers can't call in, I'm, I'm over here in the woods by myself. I'm not going to measure my two club links on table that closely. I'm just going to estimate and drop within it. I'm not going to be that careful. That this makes it in their best interest to get it right. And if people are penalized when someone calls in, it's only because the player did breach a rule. You know, the player did do something wrong. He did breach a rule. He's not innocent. And that's why in my own view, and I feel pretty strongly about it, is, you know, we should just focus on whether a breach occurred and not worry about how the committee becomes aware of that breach. Uh, I, yeah, John. My bigger question is, what phone number do you call? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, and that's one thing that's amazing is at, at, the, at the PGA Tour events, the tour officials usually have a trailer, temporary phone lines, and so forth. And the question is, how in the world does, would say, if, you know, if I were, if they're playing at Harbor Town, would I even get a hold of the rules official. I'd probably call the Harbor Town Golf Shop and I'd be a little surprised if they could give out that information. But um, <laughs> that, that, that's always surprising. Well, the committee could disconnect the telephone lines for the uh, period of the tournament. Yeah, it, uh, yeah I mean, if the committee wants to do its, you know, Sergeant Schultz impression and say, uh, <laughs> I saw nothing, I know nothing, <laughs> then, you know, that, that, that's... Their I alluded to the situation a week ago, or we talked about a state open where a spectator came up, to, you know, and presented a problem that had occurred on a round fire. And uh, it said, to, you know, hey, I think somebody just dis, 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 disobeyed the rules of golf like that. And so now, as an official, 
the firm's obligated to, to find out whether that's back. And so you go right to the player, if you can find him like that, and present it in, and he acknowledges that, whoop, yeah, I did get a job. Well, that's about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, Gary. Going back to uh, match play and claims, you know in the case of a provisional ball, the player must utter the word provisional ball or provisional. But in the case of a, a claim and match play, <clears> does the player have to utter the word claim? Hey, he doesn't have to say them? claim. I mean, the, the two main elements for making a claim or you have to say why you're making the claim. You can't just say, I don't like what you did on that hole. <coughs> you know, you have to be more specific saying, I disagree with the drop you took off the cart path. And then you have to say either I'm making a claim or I want a ruling. What words to that effect? And there's a decision, it's like 2-5 slash 1 or slash 2 slash 2, slash two that, that goes into that with, with some detail. No, I had a situation where uh, uh, two players a match, uh, the starter says, uh, okay, A, you're a 10, B, you're 11. So away they go and play. Well, they get the 11th handicap hole and they both shoot fives and A assumes, thinks that he won the hole because it, he gets a handicap stroke there. So they go to the next tee and they, they comment and talk about, well, I won that hole. And I said, like, no, I don't think you won that hole. Like, well, I'm 11. He said, well, we were announcing it was 10. So now he says, well, what do we do? We tee off, you know, there's no official around. Well, we'll get this straightened out at the end of the match, I guess. Is that a claim? So to get to the end of the match and A wins by one stroke, but he wouldn't have because of that situation. And now they go to the golf professional or they go to the shop and they look on the board and here's the handicap, he's a 10. And uh, so now, you know, how does the match say? Was that a no claim? Because you have to know the status of the match. When the yeah, no, yeah I, I, I think, you know, if, if the players say, gee, you know, one player says, look, you know, I think my handicap or your handicap is different. And if the, if they say, you know, if their words were, let's get that straightened out at the end of the match, you know, does that constitute a claim? That's probably good enough. That's mm -hmm. probably, yeah, it's close, but that's probably good enough because that implies that they want resolution uh, and they won't want a ruling. So. All right, 34-2, uh, re if a referee has been appointed by the committee, his decision is final. And uh, partly, part of the significance of that is that means that if a referee gives a player an incorrect ruling and the player proceeds accordingly, that he is not, the player is not going to be penalized for proceeding improperly. 34-3, dealing with the committee, if there's not a referee, uh, any dispute or doubtful point must be referred to the committee whose decision is final. And the committee, if it wishes, uh, can refer the dispute to the USGA whose decision is final. It goes on to say that if the dispute or doubtful point has not been referred to the Rules of Golf Committee, uh, the player or players may request that an agreed statement be referred through a duly authorized representative to the Rules of Golf Committee for an opinion as to the correctness of the ruling. So what all that means is imagine, say, uh, have a situation where Arnold and Andy are playing in a WSGA event, and there they disagree strongly with the ruling that Bill makes. And uh, this says that they may request that Bill forward uh, the facts of the situation to the USGA for an opinion as to whether Bill made the right ruling. Uh, but Bill's under no obligation to do so. He says, guys, trust me. I know what got absolutely right. I'm not going to bother the USGA with that. But if he does, if he wants, if he wants to say, look, okay, I just, you know, want you all to be comfortable knowing that the right ruling was made, I'll send this uh, uh, to the USGA. And one point that's important is, yeah, everybody has to agree on the facts. That it was amazing how often at the USGA, when I was answering phone calls, um, somebody would call up and say, hey, look, you know, this, this happened, what's the ruling? Say, oh, well, in that case, it's a loss of whole penalty. Say, okay, thank you. So I hang up, think, okay, straightforward phone call. And then 30 minutes later, I get a phone call from another person saying, wait a minute, I, I understand that you've said that I, I should have lost the whole. And I said, well, this other person said such and this, this, this happened. If that's the case, then yeah, it would be a loss of whole penalty. Well, let me tell you what really happened. <laughs> and at which point, say, look, 
why don't the two of you first agree on the facts and then get back to me and then we can uh, figure out the ruling because it's uh, it just is maddening. Mm -hmm. And if play is conducted other than in accordance with the rules of golf, the rules of golf committee will not give a decision on any question, which means if something, even the most straightforward situation comes up in a scramble, uh, don't uh, uh, ask the USGA, even if that question has nothing to do with the scramble format. All right, so a few uh, decisions. Here, look at uh, decision 34-1B-4 is a good one. Uh, it gives a good example of the application of that rule. It was reported a few days after the conclusion of a stroke play competition that the winner had changed the rate, weight of his putter during a stipulated round, something that's ordinarily a breach of rule 4-2, uh, intentionally changing the playing characteristics of the club during the round. Should he be penalized? And this, and this decision is helpful because it puts you in the shoes of the committee and tells you what their, what the committee's thought process should be. Well, the committee must determine whether the competitor knew between the time of the breach and the close of competition that he had incurred a penalty under the rules for changing the weight of his putter during the stipulated round. If he knew he had incurred a penalty, then he's disqualified. If he did not know he had incurred a penalty, uh, then no penalty would be imposed at this point after the competition had closed. Pretty simple to just deny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, I but, but again, the, the rules uh, <laughs> assume that uh, that uh, players are honest, and yeah. which and it's hard to imagine writing rules for players who are dishonest. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, we have lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see, uh, decision 34-2 slash 2, as we mentioned, if a player is uh, allowed by a referee to infringe a rule, the player's not going to be penalized. So that's one reason you often see players really working officials hard to get a certain result, because they know that even if that result is incorrect, that uh, they're not going to be penalized. 34-2 uh, slash 3. If the referee observes a player about to breach a rule, may he warn the player and thus prevent a breach. And this is something we talked about, that if you uh, see a player drop in a wrong place, but he's not yet played, you can stop him and have him correct the error and lift the ball and drop it in the correct place. So that's uh, absolutely what officials should do, as long as you do so, as the decision says, uniformly, not just to the players you like. Uh, the exception to that is in match play, if the referee has not been assigned uh, to accompany a specific group, then he does not have authority uh, to intervene uh, in such a situation. Uh, decision 34-3-1 uh, is another good one. It's actually more of a 34-1B uh, situation. During the first round of a 36-hole stroke play competition, a competitor plays a wrong ball from a bunker on number six. He realizes he's played a wrong ball and corrects his mistake. He reports to the committee before returning a scorecard, and the committee uh, incorrectly tells him that there was no penalty because he played the wrong ball from a hazard. So the committee was operating under the pre-2008 uh, Rule 15. During the second round, the committee realizes it made a mistake. So the question is, at that point, what may the committee do? May the committee uh, correct the mistake and add two penalty strokes to the player's score for the sixth hole in the first round? And the answer to that is, uh, yes, it may. That, that while the committee's decision is final, it can still correct an incorrect ruling as long as what it does is consistent with Rule 34-1B. So in this case, since the competition is not closed, the committee may go back and add that two-stroke penalty. And there's a good example of this, actually, in of that other decision uh, we saw at the uh, uh, U.S. Women's Open in 2006, where uh, one of the leaders, uh, where on the last day, there was some weather delay. It was a 36-hole final day. 
And on the final hole of the morning, the a player in the final group uh, hit her, had her ball in the grass bank of a bunker. And she hit the ball. And on television, it looked like she double hit it. As you could tell, the ball started off this way and then went veered after just a foot, you know, pretty sharply to the right. But the referee and the observer did not think in person that it had there had been a double hit. And but uh, they were alerted before she signed her scorecard that there may have been a double hit. So in the scoring area, they reviewed, FI reviewed again and again the video and decided that okay. She did not double hit the ball, so therefore no penalty for a score for that hole. Uh, she returned her scorecard, and then she went on and start, uh, had got, got something to eat and started her fourth round. Then uh, people continued to look at that uh, the video replay and concluded that the evidence was pretty overwhelming that she must have double hit the ball. So the committee decided that it had made a wrong ruling. It should have ruled that there was a one-stroke penalty. So uh, they caught up with her on the fourth hole of her final round and informed her that they, they were going to add one penalty stroke to her score for the 18th hole of the third round because of that. And, and her initial reaction was, oh, does this mean I'm disqualified for a scorecard error? And they said, no, there's no scorecard error because you had returned that score with our blessing, with the ruling of no penalty at the time. So there's no penalty under Rule 6-6D for you, but we are going to add a one penalty stroke under 14-4. And the committee uh, could do that. And that, and the answer, this is a helpful answer. Under Rule 34-3, a committee's decision is final in that the competitor has no right to appeal. So that's what final means. However, the rule does not prevent a committee from correcting an incorrect ruling and imposing or rescinding the penalty, provided that no penalty is imposed or rescinded after the competition is closed, except as allowed by Rule 34-1B. So if this situation at the women's open, what if this had happened in the final round, the ruling was no penalty, she returned her scorecard, the competition closed, then the next day the committee just says, you know, she definitely hit that ball twice. Could the committee at that point go back and add a penalty stroke? <laughs> Answer is no. Because of Rule 34-1B, the committee may not do it at that time. But this is helpful to know that there are ways to correct incorrect rulings. And uh, incorrect rulings are a fact of life. You know, with the expression that has many applications and many walks of life. Uh, but in our world, uh, we say there are two types of rules officials. Those who have given wrong rulings and those who will give wrong rulings. And that's it. There's no other type of rules official. Because it will happen. That's why you see under Rule 34 that uh, in recent years decisions have been added to provide guidance to committees uh, as to how to proceed when incorrect ruling uh, does happen, because it, it will. Um, decision, let's see, 34 3 slash 4 uh, is a good one because, again, it helps. Uh, look at things from the committee's perspective as to what its thought process should be when there's a uh, question of fact. In stroke play, B uh, claimed that A had played from outside the team ground 15. A stated he played from within the team ground. How should the committee rule? Well, it's a question of fact whether A played from outside the team ground. The matter should be resolved on the basis of the weight of evidence. In this case, it was B's word against A's, and the weight of evidence did not favor either competitor. In such a case, the benefit of the doubt should be given to A, the player of the stroke. So that final paragraph is, is a useful one to keep in mind, because that situation certainly does come up on the golf course a lot with various situations. It could be an argument as to whether a play, player played from the right place, an argument as to whether a ball moved, as to where, where a ball last crossed the hazard margin, things like that. And what this says when it's one person's word against the other, uh, uh, give ben benefit of the doubt to the uh, uh, player whose ball is involved. Decision 34-3-6 is a decision we've referenced uh, several times, and it's a useful one. It kind of pulls together with one theme a number of 
other decisions uh, to tell us what to do when a player proceeds under a rule that does not exist. And some of the uh, key points there, with the first example it gives with 18-2A-3, where the player uh, drops his ball away from a boundary stake under the mistaken belief that the boundary stake is an obstruction. That in that case, he is considered to have proceeded under Rule 18. And the, the decision does answer the question as to whether the player may be considered to just proceed under Rule 28, unplayable ball rule, which would involve just one penalty stroke. And the answer is no, he may not. Because, as it says, Rule 28 requires the player to have the intention to proceed under it before lifting the ball. So therefore, the committee may not apply Rule 28 to the player's action. As there's no rule that allowed the player to lift his ball in such a situation, uh, really by default, the player, the committee will apply Rule 18-2A. Then there are other situations where, uh, for example, the last one in particular, that um, you know, Rule 27-1 stroke and distance will be used by the committee as the applicable rule. But that's a, a useful decision uh, mm -hmm. to know. Now, decision 34-9, a good one that uh, relates somewhat to 34-3-4, resolutions of questions of fact, referee, and committee responsibility. And we won't go through this in uh, detail, but it, is, it should be somewhat reassuring that even this published decision tells us in the very first line that resolving questions of fact is among the most difficult actions required of a referee. That Because uh, once you know the facts, the rules are often pretty easy to apply. And one thing that's difficult is throughout the decisions book, you have some decisions that say, well, give the benefit of doubt to the player. Others will say, resolve any doubt against the player. For example, we just saw a decision saying give benefit of the doubt to the player, but then in a case, uh, Gene and I were exchanging emails about about the deci decision under Rule 21, where, where the question is whether a ball was cleaned in a certain situation. And that decision says resolve any doubt against the player. So naturally, you know, we're scratching our heads saying, well, what is it? Do you, when do you resolve the doubt in favor of the player and resolve the doubt against the player? And this decision tries to. Um, uh, provide some guidance there, and it helps walk through the kind uh, of the process the committee uh, should take. For example, where it talks about testimony of the players involved is uh, important, and so forth. And then, but it does acknowledge there's no hard and fast rule for evaluating the testimony of the players or for assigning weight to be given to such testimony. And each situation must be treated on its own uh, merits. Goes on to say, it's important that any questions of fact be resolved in a timely manner so the competition may proceed in an orderly way. So we won't go through the entire decision, but it's a good one to know. And if for nothing else, we should take comfort in knowing that we're not the only ones who feel awkward or challenged in deciding some questions of fact, as they often are the toughest uh, uh, points to resolve. So, any uh, questions on Rule uh, 34? All right, well, if not, let's take a, why don't we take a 15 minute break and we'll resume at uh, 10 20. So, uh, for those people that are online, in the email link that was sent out earlier this week, uh, you'll find a link within that email to the rules reference guide. Within the rules reference guide is a practice exam. And that is what we're going to be going over following the break. So you could uh, uh, check that out while we are breaking for those of you that are online. Which more set? Well, you good. It starts with the floor on the you're the great card. Huh? Jackie Curse is the great card. 
But then I couldn't go back in. The way it was set up, you couldn't check what the URL address was. We're going to have to ask Dave. How are we going to find that? Last one. Woo. Can you say that you're going to have 